Thank you everyone for joining us for another one of our expansion seminars. My name is Michael. I'm the founder of The Flying Sage. We're a psychedelic community based in Vancouver. We host about three to four events per week now as the fall has begun. Everything from cold exposure to breath work. We do some microdose breath work events. We have seminars like this and we also do integration circles too. So if you're curious to learn more about the community and the different offerings we have, feel free to come chat with me at any point. I'll maybe share a little bit more at the end, but I really just want to focus first on, yeah, welcoming you all here. And so I'd love to invite you all to join me in sharing some gratitude for, for Damien and for this space. Damien is grateful enough to let us use this space each time we have a seminar. So I just wanted to give Damien a round of applause. Thank you, Damien. Yeah, Nemesis has been really wonderful in accommodating a variety of different psychedelic communities here in the space. So it's really beautiful to, to be here under this beautiful mushroom. Another gratitude wave I want to put out there is for our volunteers. We've got a variety of people here that have been helping out to welcome you in, to help set up, to help clean up. So let's give another round of applause for volunteers. Thank you, everyone. All right, so we're going to get started. Every expansion seminar that we have focuses on a different topic. And today we're going to be revisiting a topic that we've also visited in the past, and that is perspectives on psychedelic guiding. And so this is going to be a great seminar for anyone that is a guide themselves or a facilitator, but also anyone that's just curious about the different ways that facilitators approach guiding, because there's lots of different approaches. And so I wanted to also mention, in addition to a community building hat that I'm wearing, I'm also going to be wearing for this conversation as moderator, a facilitator hat as well, because that's also something that I do. And for, from that perspective, I'm really, really curious and honored to be sharing the stage with these four wonderful facilitators and really excited to hear each of your unique perspectives. So we're going to get started. I'm going to have each facilitator introduce themselves and we'll go from there, starting with Aga. Hello. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me back. My name is Aga. I work in tandem with my partner, Deus, who's not here tonight, and we're called Soma Heart. <laughs> That's the name of our practice. And yeah, so I always have a tricky time describing what I do because I do so much. <laughs> but really, to distill it down, my passion is to help people reconnect with their authenticity. And the tools that I use and medicines and allies I work with are combo, mushrooms, bufo, and of course your breath, and on the precipice will soon be your own voice. These are powerful medicines that really help open us up to ourselves, and that's what I'm most passionate about. So I will leave it at that. Hello, I'm Sagan, and thank you, Michael, for organizing this and bringing community together. It's a really privilege to be here and to be up on this stage. So. My partner and I run the Earthlings Institute, so we, we do 5-MEO group experiences, private sessions, community circles. We run community circles for integration. We also run a facilitator circle where we bring facilitators together to talk about best practices and facilitation. I'm feeling very nervous, so I apologize. <laughs> Just want to put that on the table. <laughs> um, <laughs> My journey personally with psychedelics goes back about 15 years. I was drawn in my early 20s to this work for anxiety, for depression, for just showing up in my life in a way that I wanted to. It's been a, a long journey, a journey of facing a lot of my fears, a lot of my, I think sort of the deepest, the deepest parts of myself. And, and that's really what I valued psychedelic work to do is to really come, come into contact with you know, the parts of ourselves that, that we don't always have the ability to look at so easily in the rest of our lives. What else do I want to say? Yeah, I think, you know, it's an honor to do this work. You know, I, Helena and I have been doing this work full time for the last two years. We've seen about 100 clients in that time. And, you know, every single one of those has been just an absolute honor to witness the transformations that we've seen and just to be part of that that unfolding, that, that journey. Um, yeah. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Joni, and Michael, thanks for organizing this. It's always wonderful for our community to get together and for us to share information because I am a strong believer when we get together and gather and share knowledge and experience, that's how we empower one another. And so I'm really excited about this. <laughs> Just a little bit about myself, for those of you who don't know me, I do a lot of different things. A lot of it's very creative based focus and that's what led me into facilitating and working with plant medicine. I've been working with altered conscious states and music for a very long time. My original training is in music therapy, so working with people and their bodies and their vocals and giving them voice if they don't have voice through instruments, tapping into their altered conscious states through music and finding healing through that is my one of my specialties. And that kind of went down the rabbit hole into other conscious states, such as through hypnotherapy and guided imagery and music, and then plant medicine found me. And it's such a wonderful space because through plant medicine, it really gave me an understanding of how it really allows you to invite your inner healer and your inner wisdoms to really shine through. So it's almost like, oh, here's the key that you've always had access to, and this is what you've known, but maybe perhaps forgotten. And now let's begin, let's do the work. And that's such a beautiful gift and space and teacher to have. And I'm like, yeah, this is such a beautiful teacher. I want to do more of this work. And that's what led me into working more with medicine and how to do it in a gentle way. Because oftentimes, you know, medicine's like, this is what you need. And then maybe your environment and space might not have it. So creating that sense of safety and then also slowing things down. How do we create space for self? How do we create space and take up space? Because even taking up space is so hard. And how do we do that with medicine softly and gently? And that's my passion. And that's why I started working with different people, including Lucinor and a couple of other wonderful, knowledgeable people in creating protocols and, and ways in working with microdosing DMT because there's so much said about doing ceremony with medicine and then there's so much you can do also less is more. So yeah, I love exploring that. <laughs> and that's a little bit about me. Hey everyone, I'm Soul Dr. Dick, like Sagan. A little bit of the nerves, I can feel it. I can feel the almost tension for myself and in the room. But it's good to be amongst friends. I'm gonna look back there and I see Trina with her little one and I always tell people, Trina, I call you my fairy drug mother. <laughs> yeah, she introduced us to the medicine back when I thought it was a drug. And I see Gabo sitting up here in the front and during our first toad school, he was the first person to serve me the five. So I'm always grateful for that. And it was at Elena and Sagan's Toad School as well that they, that they helped Trina run. So there's so many connections. And Michael, first ceremony, and then we had our first expansion seminar way back when with Yvonne and Lana, who I got to train with and learn from. And I was moderating, I was sitting in your shoes, and now I'm here. And I remember Aga from A Man Talks, and when she first told me about Soma Heart and all they're doing, I was like, oh wow, there's a lot of stuff out there. And Joni and I have known each other since before all this stuff. Yeah. yeah, we've been friends for a long time. So it's sitting amongst friends here. And that's a beautiful thing. I came from the medical profession. I used to be a medical doctor and had to burn out and go through my own challenges and then find medicine, find my beloved Iris is here sitting next to the bracelets back there. She doesn't like being pointed to, so I won't point. I'll just mention her name. And our greatest teacher is my son. He's three years old now. He's going to be three, actually, this Saturday. I say Saturday because Sunday is his solar birthday and Friday is his lunar birthday. So, yeah, he was born in the full moon. And medicine has taught so much, has given so much. Grandmother Aya actually called down his soul two years before he was born, like literally to the day, which is crazy. And I've had crazy experiences, almost psychotic breaks myself. I facilitated so many different experiences with many amazing healers. They wouldn't call themselves shamans, but that's what most people would refer to them. And so there's been all the range of experiences, people running away, people calling, wanting to call the hospital, all the stuff is there. And so now I play primarily with breath, Ohana breath, 
um, because I see it as we come as strangers and we leave as family. I remind people that we have fun. Like, spiritual work doesn't have to be serious. We always take it so seriously, and everything's a ceremony, including I facilitate a lot now with my dear friend Courtney, who's here, and she just went through a ceremony recently with her beloved Phil. They just got married less than a month ago, and then they've had a spiritual wedding as well, I know, that I can't wait to hear more about as well. And I often say that my beloved and I had two regular weddings, but it was the third one with Grandmother Ayahuasca that really said, oh, are we supposed to be together? Because when we left that, I was like, shit, what if she's changed so much that she doesn't want me anymore? And then I realized that's just part of the fear. And so what I love is that we're sitting here together today to talk about our experiences and talk about how we're still growing. Right now, I'm in a year-long container with Aubrey Marcus and crew, fit for service, because I realize there's always more we can look at to be fit for service. And the thing that I come up with is that we receive to give and we give to receive. And most of us are really good at giving. Like, I know everyone up here is really good at giving. And my work this year has been remembering, how do I receive as well? Because if I receive, then I'm better at giving. I'm going through the blocks that I have. I'm not lying to myself and saying, I've got this. I've made it. Like, the ego is so good at that. Yeah, and saying, we've got it all. So I know there's lots of questions. Know that everything's on the table. And one of the things that came up for me before even getting here today was just a reminder for the medical days. We don't talk enough about how things can go wrong. We don't talk enough about how things have gone wrong. And know that if you want to ask, I am definitely open to talking about that because I think that this is such a sacred thing to do and we can learn from each other instead of just repeating mistakes over and over again. And know that whatever happens, it's not a mistake, it's part of the process. It's just how can we learn together and how can we realize that we can be held? You know, I know everyone here is doing really good work and I know if they've gotten this far in their journey, that stuff has happened. <laughs> and I know even for myself and everyone I've worked with, almost the more you do this, there's going to be detractors of the work that you do. There's going to be someone who says, ah, they're not that good. And know that that's okay. It's okay because it's about finding the fit for you, whatever it is. And that's why I love that there's so many people in this space now. So thank you, and I can't wait to get started. Thank you, everyone. Let's give a round of applause for our panelists. One brief housekeeping note before we jump into some questions, just noting that this is going to be recorded. And so as a gesture to our future podcast listeners, try your best to keep the mic nice and close. And that way we'll get a crisp recording for everyone out there. So jumping into things, I think from each of your intros, it's clear that there's multiple different pathways to facilitating and hence lots of different perspectives on facilitating. And so the first question I have for each of you is, you know, what are some qualities that make for an effective psychedelic guide, in your opinion? Well, I guess the, the one that really stands out to me or that, that I really value in the work that Helena and I do is, is really approaching people with love. And it sounds like a very simple thing. And in a sense, it is a very simple thing. But it's also a very deep thing. And, you know, I think we, my belief in this is that we really need to receive people without trying to change them, without having an agenda that they should be something different, that we need to fix them in any way, but just to, you know, just to receive them exactly as they are for all of their, all of their shame, all of their pain, all of their, everything they're bringing is just, you know, just be able to sit with them in that space. So, and I think that that's something that does require personal work sometimes to get there. Happy to pass this on. Just building on what Sagan said, it's not just only having that unconditional view of the client and, and respecting where they are coming from, having the same for yourself. And like also what you said, it's like very often as facilitators or therapists, it's very easy to give. And then even in life, it's very easy to give because life expects it, whether as being a parent or being a child or even in work or school, we're asked to give quite a bit. And so giving, the act of giving is so easy. But to receive, that's much more difficult. And so 
as a good facilitator, you need to learn to actually see your own stuff and to be able to receive what the medicine is also showing you because it's you're processing this not just only from the client's perspective. You're part of this, whether it's a triad or dyad, depending on how you're serving the medicine, and you're not separate from the container. So meaning your stuff will be triggered, your stuff will come into the space as well. And if you cannot hold space for that, how can you hold space for someone else? No. I agree, yes. <laughs> someone who does their own shadow work so that your ceremony doesn't become their ceremony. <laughs> I've definitely been in containers like that. It's like, oh, okay, I hold space for you now. Okay, I thought it was the other way around. But I would add genuine curiosity to understand, not make assumptions of like, oh yeah, these are, these are the diagnosis and that, so I know what's wrong and I know exactly what to do. But somebody who is actually humble and has can say, I don't know what to do, but let's be curious. Let's be really present and listen to what is happening in the moment. Somebody who asks really good questions, somebody who don't, won't give you the answer, because then they'll rob you of coming up with that wisdom on your own. And there's something really beautiful that happens in, in a place where you are led to find your own answers is through your own contemplation or your own inner emotional processing, those neural pathways get, get made. Versus somebody's like, here you go that insight will just fade and it's like, oh man, I know the solution to my problem, someone told me, but I can't remember. <laughs> but when we have that lived experience, it's in there. So yeah, genuine curiosity to understand and somebody who um, guides you to find your own answers. I love this. And the first thing is I don't know is always the most honest answer. And I'll go back to the medical days. When we diagnose, I don't know is always one of the diagnoses. What's the most common and what's likely to kill them today? In this case, for the guide piece, I was just listening to this today, it's not how to, it's how do I do it? And so as a guide, it's not, oh, I know the way you're supposed to guide. It's I know how the way I'm gonna guide. And I invite people into that container. If they feel confident and safe in that, fantastic. And not doing it on your own. One of the things I love here, and I can hear this from everyone, is that we work with others to have that balance so that we don't get in our own heads thinking, oh, I know it all, or I've got to hold it all, and I'm going to get stuck, I'm going to get lost, I'm going to get scared. Um, and it really is, I keep coming back to it, safety. Like, if you feel safe with them and they feel safe with you, then you can go through it together. And if that safety doesn't feel like it's there, know that even up to the very moment you take the medicine, a no is possible. But I tell people that's why we always do breath first because you can get off the breath train anytime. Once you take the medicine, that medicine's in there. We're riding this together. So let's make sure we really want to take this ride together. Thank you so much. So I have another question that kind of builds on this. But before that, I thought maybe just take a brief step back and define a guide for people here that maybe don't know. And in addition to that, maybe contrast between a trip sitter and a guide because that's another term that gets thrown around quite a lot. And then if someone wants to also maybe throw in psychedelic psychotherapy, where does that term fall into that realm? I'm curious if anyone here wants to just distinguish those things for everyone. Sure, I'll play. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's nice to have four of us here. <laughs> and we're all so polite. So I almost see, my beloved and I were talking, it's like, oh, you know, where, where do you have to get to before you can actually guide or anything else? So I think we can start with trip sitter. Trip sitter is someone who you've at least gone through one journey yourself, ideally more, and you're willing to sit with someone just to try to keep them safe, you know, not hurt themselves, anything else like that. The guide piece is when you've gotten to that next level where you're, okay, I've actually done some reading, I've done some learning, I'm actually going to guide the process a little bit. This is what it's going to look like. And we've done that both of those steps when we first were in it. The trip sitting was kind of a little cha a little crazy, let's be honest. But that's what we do for friends sometimes. And then the guide piece, oh, okay, we actually have an idea of where we're going. And then getting into the psychedelic psychotherapy, really you want to have, and there's lots of terms that they're trauma-informed, you want to actually have experience in dealing with whatever's going on, whether it's depression, anxiety, 
you want to actually have an idea of what it could be like to have someone have a psychotic break. How do you actually ground them back down? And I'm going to go to that next level too, where it's that kind of almost shamanistic side of things where you're like, no, I'm actually here because I'm confident and I've had the training and I've had the support and hopefully I'm not doing it by myself to actually stir up shit actively on behalf of someone and know that I'm stirring it up in a way out of love and I'm stirring it up in a way where I know that we can be safe. Yeah. And the tricky part is when you start mixing those or you step ahead of where you are. And I'm sure we'll get into that in the questions as well. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Nick. Does anyone want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would add that that, that next step after trip sitter is hopefully a guide who has had dozens of their own journeys, has de processed a lot of their own bad trips, but also has gone in to become trauma-informed either through an, another modality like somatic work or breath work, but deeply begin is beginning to understand trauma and consciousness in ego structure so they can navigate complex things that show up in our journey rather than just keeping somebody safe. They're like, okay, I know, okay, this is a part, this is a protector part coming up, I know how to work with it. Or this is a feeling that's stuck in the nervous system here, some ways I can support, right, that have some sort of a tool belt. And that's where you can go from like beginner guide to like super awesome advanced guy that's probably better than your clinical counselor who took a weekend, you know, they might have all the letters after the name and they took a weekend um, training and now they're a mushroom guide. It's like, I might maybe like that other guide better. Right, so just because a clinical counselor or a psychotherapist is working with psychedelics doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually any good, right? They're, so that's where I think also gets really confusing because you can have a phenomenal underground facilitator and a really terrible above ground facilitator. So yeah, there's a little truck in there. <laughs> and then I'd say it's up to you to do your due di diligence of interviewing a guide so that yeah, you feel safe, you trust their credentials and you know if that person can support you because if you have complex PTSD, don't ask your friend to sit with you. Don't ask a guide who's been doing it for like a year, you know. <laughs> get get someone who, yeah, understands and who can support you. And sometimes it means working with two, working with a psychotherapist who approves of mushrooms and then working with your guide and then integrating with your therapist. Thank you for that. Thanks for that distinction. Anything else to add there? We feel good. Joni, yeah. Just like what Aga said, it's like, just because you're qualified, whether it's a trip sitter and you've had done many trips on your own, it's very different when you're holding space for someone else. And same thing, like even if you're a really experienced guy, there are some experienced guides that are very knowledgeable and sometimes that, can, that knowledge can get in the way as well. Because again, building on what we said or shared earlier, if you stop being curious and you stop really showing up presently for not only the other person you're sitting for, but for yourself, then you're no longer effective. So it doesn't matter how many accolades or designations you have under behind your name or to your attached to your name. It's like, how do you really show up? And so I think all this is like a really spectrum. And then what makes a good sitter or psychedelic psychodynamic therapist or guide really shows through how they show up for themselves and other things that they do besides medicine work. And that speaks a lot. Thank you, Joni. So coming back now to some of the answers that you guys were sharing before, the next question I had for you was what, are, what do you see as the role of the psychedelic guide in the healing process? So assuming that we're talking about psychedelics in the context of healing, because not everyone necessarily does psychedelics in the context of healing, but since that's maybe our focus today, what do you guys see the role of the psychedelic guide in that process? How do they come in? Why are they there? Sure. I, I think it's very varied, but I think a few things perhaps to bring to the table, I think is creating, creating safety. So I think often with psychedelic experiences, we want to go into what's most painful, what feels most overwhelming, so creating that sense of safety as we go into that. That includes physical safety, but that also includes the emotional safety, knowing that there's a net to catch us, knowing that there's the physical support can be a huge thing, touch, being held perhaps in the experience if that's what's needed. But I think, you know, for me, I really emphasize, yeah, it's a safety, that's a trust as we go into those places. And I love that we started with safety 
and I think the guide from the sitter is that the guide realizes it's not just the psychedelics. It's not just that moment. It's all the pieces before and all the pieces afterwards. So did we create the right set and setting? Are we in the right place? Do we know the home that we're in even? Have we done the intake so that we actually are aware of what's coming up? Have we gotten clear in your intent so that we're not just saying, oh, you've heard of mushrooms and that's what you want to do, but rather I know everyone here, we play with the medicine that feels most aligned with what they're trying to get to. Have we done things for myself? Everyone has to have breathed with me beforehand because then we've actually had that experience. Have we had some other people who work in the esoteric realms that have supported them as well? Have we got the supports afterwards so you're not like, oh, I'm going to go off to my five-day regular work meeting the day afterwards. Oh, we've got all this set up so that you're actually going to do the stuff. Have we got the things in place where it's like, oh, these are the practices I want to commit to so I actually ground myself back into reality, in this new reality that I'm in. Um, and then also being available and knowing that, oh, and this is the piece for the guide. Sometimes the trip sitter is like, there's just one way to get there because I've only been through my own trips. With the guide, we have both had our own trips and guided enough people that if you have a destination, we've got multiple paths for how you want to get there and which one feels like the one that's aligned with you. Because it doesn't have to be climbing a sharp, steep mountaintop. It can be a gentle backwards climb up. But it depends on the person. Some people want to hit it and hit it with that dump truck. And it's like, okay, if that's what you really want, that's what you really want. And am I wanting to support you through that? And the guide will be able to say, no. A trip sitter, usually your friend, you're like, oh, I just want to help them. Whereas the guide's like, out of all honesty, I love telling people, it's like, I don't do this because I have to. I do this because I want to. Yeah. And if I'm not the one that wants to do it with you, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. It just means that we shouldn't do it together. Thank you, Nick. I think doing it with a guide or I'll speak to how I like to work with mushrooms with my partner, Deus, and in group. There's magic that happens when we are in community and when we are in relationship. It's the relational component. Wounding happens in relationship. It's a sever of connection. And to heal that, we must heal it in relationship. I can go have an, an amazing journey on my own, yes, but it doesn't teach me how to be in better relationship with people. And there's magic that happens when we give ourselves permission to feel our feeling in front of people. There's so many people that come in that are so scared of vulnerability, but that's the thing that we also deeply want that opens our heart and connects us to each other so that I can be seen and accepted for who I am in my full spectrum of expression. Because when I was young, I was only allowed to be happy. I couldn't cry or be angry, so now I suppress all my emotions and I'm wondering why I'm anxious and depressed. Right? So there's all this unlearning that we give ourselves permission to and when we're witnessed and be able to be seen in it and be held in it, so much magic happens. I see my partner hold women for like three hours just weeping and because they've never had a safe masculine before. And here is this symbol in psychedelics. Everything is a symbol. And here is a symbol of a divine masculine holding the divine feminine. And the inner child is finally held by the parent that she was never been able, ever been held by. In real time, healing is happening. And now that person can go into the world and feel a little bit more trust towards men can feel more comfortable in being a bit more vulnerable. And that's where the integration starts. That's the stuff that truly heals. That experience wasn't the healing experience, but it's the experience that opened the door. So doing it, doing any kind of psychedelic in relationship with somebody, in presence of somebody has, I think, tremendous benefit that alone can, can never do. But that's not to say that alone isn't healing on its own. There's a whole other reason why that's great as well, because your own inner healer comes out your own self energy comes in divine your own inner healer comes in that people have also lost connection to so i would ask if you're looking to do a journey is like why why do i want a guide there um, other things to consider for a guide is someone who can actually allow you to think and reflect on things that you don't even know to ask in the first place because sometimes you don't even know what to ask. It's like, what do I ask? And I think one of the wisest questions to ask a guide is to, it's like, what questions or what things should I even consider? Because a lot of times when people go off to do retreat somewhere else, they forget to consider that when they come back, they still have to process, integrate all that experience. And sometimes when they do go to those places and have these powerful experiences, 
that is in the context of there and then their home environment when they come back to where they live doesn't change really so those are little things to think about and that's why guides who have more experience and have more diversity in working with different cultures and population and age really factors those pieces in and then bringing in that component aga really appreciative that you mentioned uh relationship we are not alone, even though sometimes we might feel like that. But that's why when you do your self-work, it's important, it's helpful, but it can only go so far because when in relationships or interrelationships, we act like mirrors to each other and then we learn a lot more. And it's really hard to run away from that because like I was just talking to someone else, the greatest medicine besides like psychedelics is like your family or significant <laughs> other. That in itself, if you say yes to someone you love and commit to that process, it's almost like that's a psychedelic drug. And they're going to be your teacher every day, whether you want it or not. And so it's through that relationship. But it's not always saying yes. Sometimes it might not always be soft, but a guide who knows how to like say no or disagree with you, but in a way that invites you into the process instead of like suppressing your feelings or emotions that also makes a big difference because the healing comes from not the conflict the healing comes from how the conflict is handled and how it's given space for you to be seen and heard as well thank you Joni. i'm curious if anyone else has anything to add there about like the mechanism of action for healing I guess, in the context of psychedelics, anything that might not have been spoken to already. Mm. We covered a lot there. <laughs> yeah, like the mechanism of action, like how is it, like what is taking place there? Like when someone has a psychedelic journey, what is actually <sighs> causing this <laughs> healing to take place? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, this is a huge question. And I guess one thing I'll mention in our work with 5-MeO-DMT, there's a large cathartic element, and I think you can see this in different ways through a psychological lens, through a more spiritual lens, but people often unburden themselves of things they've been carrying. And you kind of see that. They come in weighed down, they step out, that it's a sense that there's this huge weight, this 100-pound gorilla that's been lifted off of their shoulders. So that's one of the mechanisms that we see. It's not the only one, but it's but it's a huge one. It's just allowing ourselves to let go. And, and sometimes that's through tears. You know, sometimes that's through expressing rage and allowing that to, to release. Sometimes sometimes that's through joy. If that's if that emotion has been blocked and we haven't been able to tap into it. And then once we are able to open those doors and that can continue then in, in our life afterward, we can continue to access those places, process those emotions, those memories associated with it. So that's one mechanism. Thanks, Egan. Yeah, it sounds like you're kind of speaking to like the nature of the word itself, right? Psychedelic meaning mind manifesting. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's another way to look at the question is like, what does mind manifesting really mean? If psychedelics, if that's the meaning behind the word, and that has anything to do with how they work, what does that mean? Nick, it sounded like, it looked like you were going to say something over there. <laughs> we can always say something. Let's see here. So I look at the material world and psychedelics being, if we look at it like a drug, it's like oh, I'm taking something that's having an effect on me. And one of the biggest things that we talk about is the non-ordinary state of consciousness. It's changing us from our normal pathways, our default mode network, right? And we can see that piece. And I often take a look at almost like it's an extension of a yawn. Like if you take a look at a yawn and you actually look at your brain, your whole brain lights up. So take that and then take that into breath and do it regularly. Oh my God, my whole brain's lighting up. And then take that and add something on top of that. Wow, everything's really lighting up. And then you actually get to start to choose new paths instead of just the ones that are really there all the time. And then everything can change once you have a new path. But taking it one step further, and I know these folks here have done this as well, I'm sure. It's now, there's even a possibility sometimes when someone's blocked that I can take the medicine for them and they'll receive it, which then doesn't make any sense to my mind because, wait a second, they didn't take the physical substance, but they're getting the benefit, which reminds us that psychedelics are just affecting our energetic patterns. And so therefore, if my energy is shifted, my energy can shift your energy as well. And so we're just linked in all these different ways. So it's beyond our own understanding of how it works. And isn't that the beauty of it, that we don't have to know it for it to work? 
And sometimes we're like, oh, but if I don't understand, it doesn't work. And know that for me, especially the way I've been taught, it's like I'm supposed to know everything. And now it's a big process of, can I let go of the knowing and just let the magic happen? Allow magic. Yeah. So we'll talk both about the knowing part of things and we'll allow the magic to happen here too. I love that. Thank you so much, Nick. Allowing the mystery to be there. Yeah. There's always going to be a mystery, right? Every time we think we've gotten somewhere. And I love that. It's LSD in the mind of the universe, I think he was. He took, what was it, 73 high-dose LSD journeys. And he thought at one point, he's like, oh, I've gotten there. And then the medicine's like, oh, and this is just the beginning. And so I often look back almost in two-year increments. I'm like, man, I can't believe what I was doing two years ago. That was what I was guiding. And then I realized, oh, that's amazing that that's what I was guiding. And that's what I knew. And now, can I let go of I know what I'm doing now? And imagine two years from now, I look back going, oh, that's what I was doing? And I know that if we keep doing that, this magic is just going to keep exponentially expanding. Thank you. Something that I've recognized in my own journey, I guess, is that the degree of suffering in a journey is maybe equal to the degree of resistance. And the, the amount of resistance often comes has a relationship to su surrender or to being vulnerable, right? Like the more that we're able to surrender and be vulnerable, the more safe that we feel. And the more safe that we feel, the more deeper we can go into the journey and surrender. And on that piece of surrender, which you also brought up too, Sagan, I'm curious to know from each of you, like, what are some specific things that each of you do as guides to cultivate that safety in your containers? Like, actually, what are some specific steps that you take, whether it's before the journey starts or the day of the journey? Um, I think a big piece to that is the speaking to each person's subconscious relationship with shame. Shame is such a tricky little monster. And if you can see a person's shame and hold it with nothing but love and compassion and invite it, you can feel people's guards come down a little bit. Or even just teaching people tools and means of like, what is it like and energetics to create a safety bubble for yourself. And, and then, so from that safety sense, how can we start exploring things like shame that are very scary? Because in medicine, things can come up and you don't know what's gonna come up. <laughs> and, and depending on how the dosage and what their intentions are, some of the things can be very powerful and big and scary and instead of meeting it with fear, you can meet it with compassion and understanding. And also if your own fears are triggered, but also soften to that process as well, it really makes that difference because when you allow it in yourself, speaking with like that magic, it was like, oh, if a person takes medicine and it heals the other person, it's the same thing. Within that same space, if you allow yourself to soften to your own fears that are being triggered in that same moment, you will energetically also soften and they can sense that. And on a more neurological sense is that you start regulating yourself, they will co-regulate with you. And so that's how they start feeling that safety, even without words. I mean, babies naturally do this. And babies are, I almost say, they're almost always on psychedelics because they're so open and experiencing everything to the fullest. And that's why when they cry, they cry. And when they scream, they scream. And when they laugh, they laugh. Because they are all open and, and surrendering. So when we allow for a space like that and to create that within ourselves and allow ourselves to process th that with them, it creates that unspoken safety or co-regulation. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, anything else to add from anyone else? Sure. Yeah, I definitely agree with, with all of that. And I, I guess what I'd also add is, you know, I think one piece is really, you know, creating that alignment between the goals of the client and, and what we're trying to support them with. And so, I mean, Helena and I, in our work, we really take the time to hear the person's story to really to really understand where they're coming from so that by the time we're actually sitting in medicine we're, we're not a stranger we're someone that we've really taken the time to listen we've really had them ask us deep questions that sometimes are challenging and really been able to answer those in a way that's that's vulnerable 
and to just to get to know each other on some level that's that's a bit deeper than just sort of that that you know this we're, it's not we're not just showing up as a professional that's here you know playing this role but we're also showing up as a human and I, I think that's a big part of the safety yeah so I'll add the building the report definitely so sometimes I get an email and they're like I heard about Bufo. do you have availability this week <laughs> that's not how it works <laughs> Often it's like, okay, come for breath work, come for a combo, come to a song circle, get to know me. Do you like me? <laughs> Do you even like me? <laughs> That's the first thing. I, we have to, we have to vibe, and I you like, I have to, you know, if you annoy me, I don't want to work with you. If it's really hard to like find compassion for you, like I shouldn't work with you. So as a facilitator, you know, if your client is, don't work with them. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, definitely there's that interview process of spending some time with each other and getting to know each other. And then on the day, and even in prep work, as I really appreciate internal family systems, IFS, doing parts work with the parts that are scared, with the parts that are, are resistant. And if it comes up on the day as well, it's having, yeah, guiding my, my client through that process so they know their parts and getting the parts on board, because if you don't get the parts on board, that's what causes the resistance and then the fear. So doing the parts work. And then I always say, this is a safe place to feel unsafe. Because fear might show up, and that doesn't mean it's a bad thing or it's a bad trip. Maybe it's just fear that's been locked in the system, and fear is a tricky one to work with. But when you can say that in the beginning, this is a safe place to feel unsafe, it's really beautiful. I've had clients move through some really big fears and come out, yeah, better, not damaged, but better and stronger. You know, that sort of inspires one thing, and I, I think the, the premise here is that we're, we're trying to surrender to the process. And I think that's true on one level, but I also believe that the resistance has so much richness I mean, one way I see the medicine is it kind of it moves through us until it finds a point of resistance. And that's where the work really begins. So it's that point where we sort of hang up on the medicine, where we start fighting it, that I think is, is often symptomatic and one and the same with what we're working on in our, our life, how we show up in our life, how we resist our life in a bigger way. So when we're working with the medicine, we, we very much in a sense, celebrate those times when, when the resistance comes up because that's the beginning. And we can look at that. We can see, we can ask what that is. We can begin to work with that. This isn't on the original list, but some things that come up for me to ask about kind of in relation to safety and also just effectiveness of healing is like music and touch. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious if we could go into that a little bit. Curious to maybe hear initially what you each feel is the role of music in these sessions and how that plays a part maybe in your ceremonies. Being the music expert, I'll go first. <laughs> music, it's, I find, can you say the question again? I just lost it. <laughs> well, it wasn't the best to find question. The question could be, uh, how do you see music okay. playing a role in? Playing a role, okay. Cultivating. Uh, music really forms a creator container is what I meant to say. And oftentimes what we don't think about is if you have two guides or to trip sitters or facilitators, whatever you like to call them, as part of your process, in reality, there's actually a third, and it's the music. The third guide, well, no, there's four. Plant medicine is also a teacher and guide, and then there's the music. And how the music is used and utilized really makes a difference, because sometimes I invite the clients to bring in music pieces that really speak to them, and then we go through it together, and sometimes I'm like, oh, why this piece? And if it's all the same, I'm like, why is it all the same? Like, why, why are we resisting diversity and bringing in that resistance piece really shows a lot. So that in that form, you're already creating safety without even the plant net in. Um, and then music in itself, certain tones and frequency. I like to bring in live instruments, especially at the beginning or end, because in the middle when I'm sitting and facilitating for a person, it, I don't want to be busy playing an instrument. I want to be there 
purely for the client in, in the process, but at the beginning and the end, live music, its frequencies really hits our body in a different way. So I invite you to really think about this. When you go listen to a live concert versus listening to a recording, there's a difference. There's a felt sense difference. And that difference really goes to the core of our own cells. Like our cells vibrate at certain frequencies and that in itself is why oftentimes music is used in ceremony. You don't even, I'm not even talking about pre-recorded music. It can be even our vocals, humming, chanting, rhythm, rhythmic entrainment, our body wanting to move with rhythm because naturally our body does do that. All that is medicine and I don't know if you know this, music in itself also can actually affect our DNA. It can turn on and off switches to certain predisposed diseases or certain anxieties. So that's why music can be such a powerful tool within the process of psychedelics. I hopefully I answered that your question in that way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kicking the mic for a second because I love sitting here and I'm learning from Joni at the same time. Like, I'm like, oh, why haven't I asked them what music pieces to bring in? Like, that's such a good idea. It's like, let's add to the flavor of things and, and intersperse some familiarity there as well. And just to speak, you can keep going on the number of different players there because I like to think that there's 100,000 angels for each of us at least. And so how many players are there in every ceremony is more than we can even imagine and fathom. But the music piece, it's funny because I've had ceremonies where everything's broken down. Literally no music, and it's beautiful. And it's a reminder that it's not necessary, but it's so beneficial, but can we listen to whatever's coming up in the moment? And it's funny because people always say, wow, what speaker do you have? How's so amazing? I love that the medicine just makes anything sound good, right? <laughs> and it's such a good place to practice singing because we're like, you're such a good singer. I'm like, I love that you say that. Let's do medicine more often. <laughs> but as well, like the tools that you're going to get introduced to. There's not just the drums. I found these tuning forks. You see one at the back. I found that person that made it. There's all these tools that will fall in your lap. And every single vibration is going to make a difference. And how do you just start playing with it? How do you start having fun with it? How do you start learning from others? Like I can't wait to learn more from Joni about music specifically because I know that she's got a wealth of information there. And that's the key. It's like we're continuously learning. As you're going to listen to this, you'll see us go, oh, that's cool. Because this is a great collaboration you're bringing together. Now I get to learn from three amazing other facilitators at the same time. So thank you. This is one of my favorite questions because I do it all the time. Yeah, I lead primarily with live music and, and song and my voice. And yeah, something really magical happens. So I also say I work with mushrooms is sound is information every single tone has information in it and you have nerves underneath the skin that pull sound into the deepest part of your body and it runs it through the nervous system and the nervous system is your energy body it's your it's your emotional body nervous system or energy whatever it's interchangeable and we have all these little dams you know where we go store pockets of emotion and then sound can go in there and just like when all of a sudden there's your grief or like there's your power and then through my voice, I can invoke, I can invoke a warrior goddess through just like, ah, ah, and then all of a sudden the room is filled with like beings who are interacting with your clients and everybody's having this huge magical experience and they're like, yeah, when you sang that song, this tiger came in and my power, it's like, it's so magical. You bring in like another layer of magic when you infuse live music and you realize like this is a multi-dimensional world and we're just in one of the dimensions and like right here are beings that I'm not even aware of but I can invoke them, I can ask for their help and then they can interact with my clients, with people in the ceremony. So it's, it's so magical and it's so exciting. And then when the stillness comes, the stillness is so loud and even more can move through in the stillness. So yeah, when you can proper properly apply the right sound and those medicines also be, are quite empathic so we can feel the field so I can intuitively pe play a song that needs to be sung and it's almost like the song sings me. I can't sing a song that I want, the song that wants to be sung will come through because the songs have spirits too. The songs are medicine as well 
So this is just like scratching the surface of such a huge topic. But yes, big, big, big fan of sound. I think if anyone here was not a big fan of sound, now they certainly are. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so another thing that I had mentioned was touch. I'm curious if we could just take a brief detour and speak to that a little bit, what the role of touch is in psychedelic <laughs> therapy. Uh, sure. Yeah, so touch, I, again, I, I really, for me, it often comes back to safety. It comes back to you know feeling held, touch. Like, I think basic things like having your hand held as you're going through a difficult experience can be so supportive to feel that there's somebody there with you, their, their physical presence, they're, they're with you on this journey. We use touch in, in a variety of ways, holding different parts of the body, it can be the shoulders, the feet sometimes. And it's, the way we approach it is very much you know, intuitive or, or what the client asks for, but it's really, you know, the intention is always to you know, just offer that support, to, to support them on where they're going, not to try to steer them in any particular direction, but just to, to be there with them if that's what they need in that moment and what they want. Pass it on. Touch is a big topic, and I know it can be very controversial, especially in this type of space where a person's more vulnerable. And I like to use touch, but very carefully and in a discerning way. Being you know, a therapist for a very long time, a lot of it is when I see clients sitting across from me and there's no touch. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, but us humans, we're not made like that. We like to, when we see our friends or family, we want to, first thing we do, especially when there's that connection, we want to hug them, we want to touch them. And that's normal. There's so much healing that can come from touch and it depends on how it is used. So, Building on what Sagan said is like safety is so important. Oftentimes I like to tell clients that I invite you to ask for what you need, even if you feel embarrassed. And our job here is to keep you safe. We will say no if it's not appropriate, and that's okay. And that has happened before, and that's our job, to keep you safe. So don't be afraid to ask. And oftentimes when it comes to touch, I always invite people to ask for it first. Because when you invite someone to ask for it, in that process of asking, that is something that can be new to them. Because again, learning to receive and asking as part of learning to receive is very new and, and can be very challenging. And so that's why I was always invite. Intuitively, I sometimes will get the medicine, even if I'm not taking medicine, I can feel the medicine and energy say, they need support and touch here. And I would really want to do it, but and yet sometimes I will wait to see if the, the person will invite it first. Because again, I don't want to rob them of that opportunity to learn to start receiving, to learn to start asking. And even when they, and at some point if they don't, then maybe I'll ask them, is it okay if I give you some support here? Now to build on top of why touch can be so powerful and impactful is because Physiologically, there are certain psychodynamic things that are stored in your body that your body learns. For example, say you learn to, when you were a child, you were scolded, and then you hold your breath and you brace. And your body learns to hold that kind of energy and rigidity. And so in medicine, when certain emotions or images or stories come up for you, your body will react and, and respond the same way. And so sometimes touch, helping them feel into those pain points, and then instead of resisting them, but inviting them to feel into it, it teaches our body to learn that, ah, oh, I can feel this pain and it's okay, and that I can start moving this pain, because you're teaching their bodies how to move through that process as well. So that's why sometimes touch can be helpful. Now with that said though, sometimes I also like to invite self-touch. So I'll be like, oh, you want to be held here. What is it like if you embraced yourself like that? Because oftentimes we're not taught to even hold ourselves or to even touch ourselves and to take safety from that, let alone from someone else. So there's so many different ways of doing this, but knowing how to use it and discerning when and how to use it is very important. 
Ah, oh, I love learning here. This is great. I was laughing with my co-facilitator, Courtney, because I remember we had a ceremony where there was someone who really wanted support. She was going through the hardest stuff. And just as Joni was saying, I had the clear sayings like, I'm here, you just have to ask. She's like, it's really painful. I'm like, just ask. And it took a while, but that was a beautiful thing for her to see that she really wanted it, but she still couldn't just say, please help. And once that happened, we were able to go over and help. And it's one of my favorite things to do because I wondered often why I love getting massages. And part of it now is like every time I'm getting something and receiving, I'm like, oh, I'm learning. This felt good. This felt good. It just stores back there. We just use our intuition to say, what is it that wants to come forward now? And recognize which pieces are there. And a few things that I've noticed is the biggest, deepest muscles are the ones that hold the biggest, deepest shames. So especially the psoas muscle and getting in there. And it requires, though, getting through the outer layers so they can trust and get softer and softer and softer that they want to receive. And so now, instead of looking for consent, I don't look for consent, I look for choice. So before we start, I say, I don't want you to consent to touch. I want you to choose that you want this. Because if you don't want to choose that you want it, we don't have to do it, right? Like, let's go beyond the, oh, it's just not bad. It's actually what I want. And let's go beyond that and say, okay, let's follow intuitively, but I'm going to remind you over and over that you're a sovereign being. Like, it may seem like I say it over and over, but it's because it's to remind you, any time you can say no, more, less, you have control over this. And really, what I invite people to see is when we're on the medicine is that your soul is actually guiding me to do the things that you can't do for yourself or have been unwilling to. And so how do we play together? Because we're just playing together. And then with the touch, it can open up different channels. And I've had that before. Like, we store and we hide pieces of ourselves. I love that parts work idea. We have all these protectors. We have all these exiles inside. And almost sometimes we're t the touch is actually chasing them to get them to be felt and recognized and brought to the surface so you can actually say hello to them again and realize, oh, I actually want to be part of that. And I love afterwards, I always remind people, please share what you experience because often I'm just following the intuition and it's such a great reflection back when they say, how did you know how to do this exactly then? And the answer always is I didn't. Like my conscious mind didn't know how to do it. If I thought about what I was doing, then I wouldn't have done that. But you helping to reinforce that loop helps to remind me that it's not me that's doing the work. And often I think that's the thing that we come to as guides and further along is that if our ego says, I'm doing this, Nick is doing this, wow, I really know what I'm doing, that's the moment I lose the magic. As opposed to saying, okay, whatever wants to work through me right now, please, I could really use your help because this person could really use it as well. And how do we work together and play? Yeah. And the last piece about touch is keep learning. There's so many modalities, there's so many places to learn, so keep receiving yourself. I find that's the best way to learn. I love when I heard someone say, it was another doctor, he's like, I took a Reiki course. I was like, okay, did you receive it? He's like, no, I took the course though, so I know how to give it. <laughs> and that's what we've been taught in this world now, right? Especially in the Western modalities, is you're not, you don't need to receive it, you just need to learn how to do it. And very much, I think all of us here are like, no, first we receive, and if we've received it, oh, now we have a whole different level of understanding. And we're going to keep receiving more and more because it feels good and we're having fun. And I love that last piece. I think Aga spoke to it. It's like, if I'm not having fun with you, if you're like, you're going to pull me out of my suffering, I'm like, I don't want to. Obviously, you haven't suffered enough yet because you think someone needs to pull you out. <laughs> so like Ramdas says, like, go away for a year. Keep suffering. Come back when you've actually hit the rock bottom. And then we'll play. Because we would love to support you getting out of that, but we're not going to pull you out. Yeah. All right. So we'll move on to another piece now around cultural safety, I guess we could say. I'm just curious to hear from each of you how different cultural backgrounds have weaved into your guiding practice, especially from the perspective of you know, having clients with different cultural backgrounds coming into your practice, how you might have had to accommodate that, or if if you change things, how do you do that? What does that look like in your practice? Can I go first? Felt like I just talked a lot, but okay. What I love is that I look Chinese, but I actually grew up white. So I grew up in PEI, and if you've ever been to Prince Edward Island, you'll know that I didn't realize that I was Chinese because there's no other Chinese person around me. But it's allowed me to have the different perspectives there. And what I've noticed every time I work with other facilitators is that once I joined the team, the clientele shifted. 
because they could see that it was okay. Like, and for myself, when I was 36, I thought these were all drugs. And if it wasn't for my fairy drug mother, Trina, I would never have actually trusted this. And how do we deal with that? Well, I love that we can actually speak to a little bit more people saying, like, oh man, you know what it's like to have this pressure. You know what it's like to have this. It's like, part of me does, part of me doesn't, but thank you for actually bringing it up now bringing up your own culture because even if we look the same it doesn't mean we had the same background but i have an understanding of it especially as an asian male who thought he was white trying to come to vancouver and date other asian females who were definitely not white and we're like what is wrong with you like why are you so forward why do you want to hug me why do you not instinctively know that you're supposed to pay for everything why are you all these pieces that I didn't realize the unspoken rules? And I did because I had other Asian relatives, but I didn't realize they were there. And so can we actually own that there are a lot of unspoken rules and speak to it? You don't have to be the same culture. And I love that as I get into this work more, people don't know what my ethnicity is. I, the other day someone's like, oh, are you indigenous? Like, and I was like, well, no, but thank you. And she's like, well, thank you for this country anyway. I'm like, all right, that's okay, you know? And as we look at each other, especially eye gazing during ceremonies, you can see the melting away of faces. And I imagine you guys have experienced that. You can see all the cultures melting away, all the beings melting away, and realize that we probably have been all the different cultures. But right now, how do we speak to that? How do we actually have sensitivity without actually being too sensitive. I've had people tell me, I really want you, especially in a group breath, to use these words. I'm like, that's wonderful. I appreciate you saying that. And what I'm gonna be reminded of is to say in the beginning, remember everything here comes out of love. And if you can remember that love and that safety is there, then can you allow yourself to be triggered in a loving, safe bubble? Because that's what we all would like. We'd like to actually experience our triggers in those spaces and not just the ones where we don't feel safe. And I think that's the reminder that I would say for all of us is that we want to be sensitive to it, but we also want to just remind them, hey, I'm not going to get it right. I'm never going to get it right, but I will keep doing my best and I'll keep being open to whatever it is that comes up. Yeah, I, I really love that piece, Nick, about we're not perfect. <laughs> well, that's <very> Asian. <laughs> right? We're not perfect. Yeah, very Asian. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, we're, we can get things wrong, but is what we do with it when we get things wrong. I think that's the most powerful part is that repair and admitting that, oh, I was wrong. I've done it and before where I recognize that I didn't show up in the way that I could have and recognizing how I was like, oh, maybe you feel like this because I'm sensing this. And just even naming that, naming your own flaws and naming what you're experiencing in the whole process really makes that difference in safety in the cultural piece. Too. I mean, yes, I look Asian. I am very Asian in some ways. So I'm like you, I am not, not a banana. I am very Asian. And I, I guess in some ways I'm very thankful that my, my parents were very traditional and very strict. And I grew up with all of that suppression that you can think of. So you can see how much work I've done on my own as well. And it really gives me a deeper understanding of where it comes from when I work with different cultures. And that's why I'm very cautious of it. And it can be very refreshing. And I think when you don't, like, no, you don't have to look Asian or be a certain ethnicity to work with another person of that ethnicity. This is where it boils down to, though. If you do not feel comfortable, then that's going to show up maybe it's not the right client for you, and you're not a good fit for them. It has nothing to do with your skill set. And also honoring that even if they look similar to you, do not assume. Be curious. I mean, a client, and you know, plant medicine, yes, they're wonderful teachers, but your clients are amazing teachers if you learn to listen and lean in. I worked with a client, and I have her permission to share this, who is all Caucasian, all white, and yet her traumas were shared similar to mine because I was brought up and raised and born in Hong Kong. And she had a similar ones because she was an expat living in Hong Kong. And I was like, oh, this is very fascinating. She had the similar traumas that I faced as a child, and yet she's white and she comes from a very white background. She's half Jewish, 
yet because she lived in Hong Kong earlier in her early years and was exposed to that, she also had those cultural traumas. So it's not specifically to your ethnicity, per se. It's just learning to be open and curious to each person's intersectionality and really having that curiosity and not assuming. So once you stop being curious, that's where the danger comes in. And when you stop really also seeing yourself as a guide or an individual or a therapist and what who you are truly as you show up authentically, if you stop seeing that, then you also stop being effective as well. And it's also understanding your, your ownness and being authentic with that. And when you can show up authentic like that, you allow others to show up with their cultural pieces as well. Yeah, I think an, another aspect of culture that, that we've seen a lot in our work is people showing up with a variety of different religious beliefs. Right? And I think this, this can be a tricky one because, you know, as we work with psychedelics, we have our own firsthand experiences with, with the spiritual realm. We might have our own convictions about what's true. And I think it can be difficult to maintain that humility and, and not to say, you know, this is this is how it is, right? And really, yeah, it really show up with that openness and that, you know, that willingness to meet people exactly where they are and to honor that if they're coming in with a particular conception of what God is, that we can that we can try to see it from that perspective. And I think this is shows up in particular with, with five MEO because it has this, this this title, the God molecule, right? So it really brings in these these discussions around what is God, what are we actually trying to access on this medicine? Um, and you know, I think, yeah, like, like I said, this is just one of these points of humility for me is always always trying to, to put my own discoveries and my own, my own conclusions somewhat on hold and just show up with that, that openness to, to what other people are going to discover themselves and and really, really invite that that process of them coming to their own conclusion. All right. Well, there's so much more, so many more questions I want to ask each of you. I'm wary of time. I want to save a bunch of time for questions from the audience. So I'm just going to ask one more question, and it's one of the ones that I had prepared here, skipping down towards the bottom. I want to ask about your perspectives on money and this work, because I think that's also a really important topic that doesn't get talked about a lot in these settings. So really just be curious to hear if each of you are open to it to just share about how you approach this work and how it intersects with like your finances. Like how do you approach that conversation? How do you charge for this thing? What are your thoughts on that? I know it's a general vague question, but just curious if you could share anything about your path there. Yeah, it's a juicy topic. A lot of people have this opinion that it should be free. And I was speaking to a First Nations elder and they said, back in the day, the, the medicine person, they were provided for by the community. They didn't have to work. When the hunters went out, the best piece of meat went to the healers. The house was paid for. Everything was taken care of by the community because they were, their job was the health of the people. And they needed to be clear so they could be connected to spirit. They could be that clear channel. They needed to be in seclusion so they could speak to the plants. Like that was their full, full-time job. So yeah, they didn't pay. <laughs> but I have rent to pay. I got to eat. I mean, sure, just go up and give me elk. <laughs> you can have a free session for sure. <laughs> right? And there's so much energy that goes into, you know, becoming, sitting where we are here, our own journeys. I paid thousands of dollars to my therapists and trips to um, the Amazon and courses, right? All of that took a lot of money so that I know what I do so I can hold you in a safe way. And then also my energy and my time is valuable. I've come to a place now where I know my worth before I didn't. And I undercharged because I realized I have to take care of my body. Now I have an acupuncturist to go see and I need to take an Epsom salt bath and, and Epsom salt costs money like every we live in a like a monetary world to so I you know to survive and to have this 
so that I can continue, continue providing good work, I have to charge money. That being said, I do recognize that there is a gap. You know, so many people in poverty who need this the most can't pay the hourly rate. And when it becomes above ground, it's going to be what, like five, ten thousand dollars for a psilocybin session? It's ridiculous. So I, I do offer sliding scale. A lot of my work is sliding scale. And generosity of those who are better off pay for those who you know, are scrounging up pennies. And then I do also have a scholarship fund. I save a lot of, you know, 10% of my income and I put it in a jar. And when someone comes to me and they really need help, it's like, great, I've got a jar for that. I've got my abundance jar. This is on behalf of the universe spreading abundance because I do believe it sh you know, money shouldn't hold you back from it. And my journey, yes, to come to this place was a own journey of my own self-worth to know how much I'm worth and how much I have to offer. And when I, when I am starting out as any kind of, like, say, a guide who's listening to this who's starting out, yeah, don't charge $1,000 an hour. You're not worth that yet. <laughs> you know, maybe do some freebie sessions, maybe some small sliding sale sessions because you are in that place of apprenticeship. And there are a lot of hours you do first for free or for low cost or for trades. So knowing that you do build up to that. So that's, that's my, my thought. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, this is something that, that Helena and I have struggled and thought a lot about over the years. I think we've, we've had our journey from being fully donation based to being sliding scale. Currently we ask for a fixed price but we do, we do have a sliding scale that we offer to people that are both in financial need and where we feel, they feel that the service could be especially helpful. So it's, it, it's very much a discretionary thing. We're always trying to strike that balance between taking care of ourselves, our own need to pay our bills, live in this world, continue our training, and also trying to be accessible to the people that need this work. And it's, it's an ongoing balance that we try to strike. Pretty much what these two have shared so far, I, I do echo that. And it's just, when it comes to money, I think it's not just only money in itself, the energy around it and how this, our society and the system utilizes it. It's just unlearning that and then bringing in your own self-peace worth or your self-worth piece into the component. And then also understanding that those energetics and relationship with money that you struggle with, your clients as well. And so when oftentimes I have clients like, I can't afford this, and I'm like, well, that's interesting. Okay, tell me more. I mean, are you really can't afford this, yet you suddenly spent, you know, Twenty dollars on five packs of smoke today, and you and that adds up, right? And so I, I, it's just being curious about where they utilize that energy and set a piece because oftentimes when it comes to money, it's not. Yes, I do have to pay rent. There's all that stuff, but I also recognizing that if you don't invest in yourself, why would you invite me to invest in you? Because I know. I can commit to you, but are you willing to commit to yourself and the work you're going to do? Because that shows a lot. Because I can't do the work for you. I'm so sorry. As much as I would love to, like, bonk you on the head and come out of suffering with me and play, it doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, it doesn't that work, work that way. And I'm saying this with compassion, and I do offer a sliding scale when need to, yet also honor from all the work and all the energy and you know, education and money in a way that I've spent it to further and feed into this. Sometimes I laugh and talk about this with my partner as well. It's like, oh, I think I'm in the wrong industry. <laughs> uh, if, because with psychedelics, when you do the work right, as in when you actually create that space to invite others to be in that healing space and allow them to do their own work, they don't need the medicine anymore. They should not need to see you forever in perpetuity. Maybe once in a while, like a car, you need to tune up. I mean, that's what it is. But for me, it's really building that community, right? And so if we all thrive in a community, we are each our medicines to each other, that comes free. So then how do we start supporting each other in different ways that isn't always based on money or in a way that money thrives and builds community. So that's a different way of looking at it as well. 
I love this question, and I love that we're talking about it openly. Hmm. And I agree with everything that's here. I really appreciate that reminder, like, you know, in the indigenous communities, like, yeah, the medicine person, everything was taken care of. So, of course, you're not going to charge because you have everything you want. And that's really what money today is supposed to represent, but it represents fear. And often, my beloved and I, we chat, it's like, we have so much abundance because abundance is the people that we know that we know never let us be homeless. Like when I look at it, I'm like, I'm never going to be homeless. I have so many people I know that if I actually got there, they would take care of us. But money also represents the ability to do things. And I love working with Aubrey Marcus now. He's like, no, like he's tried to do things totally different. He's like, it's the world isn't quite ready for it yet. He's like, I had made a ton of money off on it, but I did something completely donation-based and we lost millions of dollars. It's like it didn't work yet, but I'm willing to try. And that's part of me. I'm continuing to try. So one of my big audacious goals is by December, I'm going to create 100000 in value per month. But I'm shifting it from how much am I making to how much value am I creating. And then if I can look from there, the money I, I believe is going to flow in, and I still do that too. We, we charge for our ceremonies, and I love when people say it's not worth it or it's too much or it's too little. Like even when they say when it's above ground, it's five to $10,000, noticing our own language, oh, that's too much. It's like, why is that too much? Why is it that in my old Western world, I could be a doctor making over a million dollars, and no one would say that's too much. But now if we're talking about us as healers, if we made over a million dollars, we'd be like, oh, they're greedy, right? And can we let go of that ourselves? Can we notice our own blocks? Each of us has our own money wounds. Like, I definitely have my money wounds. My dad wanted to give away all his money at the end. And I was like, you know what? I've got a son now. It would be really nice to get a little bit extra. You know? And I'm in a place where it's expensive to buy things. I wouldn't mind that. So I have no problems now with making more money. We want to live a good life. We want to keep getting training. I've invested over half a million dollars so far in training. Right? And I want to keep doing that. And I keep giving things away, too. I don't have the structures that Aga has. I love that she can share from her elder perspective, really, in this sense, that she's got a structure for that. Mine is really just if someone comes and I really want to serve them, I serve them. And often my beloved's like, why? And I'm like, oh, shit. i got to explain it and justify it. And I get it because she's like, you've got me. You've got our kid. You've got a cat now. You've got all these things that are depending on you. And, yes, we're really lucky because we worked in the pharmaceutical world for years. And so, therefore, we made the money off of that. And it's funny because there, again, no problems at all, right? I sold a billion-dollar drug. It was crazy then. And now we're actually doing something that we know works, we believe in. How do we actually create that financial wealth? Because we want to transfer the money from where it's going unconsciously to where it could be consciously used. And I think that's the reminder. I invite guides to come in. Yes, initially, I volunteered essentially a lot of things. I angeled in a ton of ceremonies. I angeled a lot of breaths. And eventually, actually right now I'm already creating it, is I want my big group breaths to be essentially as free as possible. Anyone can come. Because if I can scale it, fantastic. But if I'm going to spend one-on-one -on -one time with you, it has to be worth it for me to leave my family. And that's the piece I take a look at. It's like, what is it worth for me to spend a day with my beloved and my son playing? It's worth a lot of money. And I remember when I was young, my dad is a pediatrician. I didn't see him much because he was always working. And I'm like, I don't want that same life. And I want that for everyone here. I want that for everyone to be able to value themselves that same way. We just haven't figured out a way to value ourselves in a way that's healthy yet. And I want every single person up here to make a shit ton of money. I'm just going to say that out loud because I know that if you make a shit ton of money, it's going to go to a great place. And let's keep doing that. Let's keep supporting each other. Let's notice when we take each other down because we're playing that game of comparison that always happens. Oh, they charge more. They must be better. No, they charge more because that's what they charge. You get to choose whether you go see them or not. It's always a choice. And please keep choosing. And please keep spreading the message. And I love this community that we're creating. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you all so much for sharing so generously on all these questions, all these topics. Yeah, I really appreciate each of you coming here and like not holding back on certain things and just really being open with everyone here. So thank you. I'd love to invite, yeah, a round of applause for all of our panelists here.
so we're gonna save we've saved about half an hour for questions and so what we'd love to do is we're gonna pass around this mic to anyone that has questions feel free to address it to the panel or to someone individually and just also try to make sure yourself to keep the mic nice and close so that everyone can hear including our people listening virtually and do you mind helping pass around Wow, what a great panel, like so on point, really enjoyed it. I have a question about relationships. So we all talked about how important relationship is in the quality of service and care that you devote to others and the, the outcome, the, the benefits of that. So I was just curious, what's your take on like short-term relationships versus long-term, right? Because sometimes people just come for some prep, do a journey, do some integration and close versus those who you're maybe seeing for much longer, right? I think of like psychedelic psychotherapy sometimes. It can be, you know, a much longer process. So yeah, I was just curious your take on it. Yeah. I'll start with that. One of the things that I've come to is that how can I look at people not as my clients and how do I not look at as a creative independence? I, I love that Joni spoke to that. We're not like, it's a terrible line of work in the sense that we're actually creating independence and intuition. But it's beautiful in that sense. And so my own perspective on this now is, I'll see you, and if you want to create a relationship, talk to me and we'll choose together. But you get to keep choosing. Yeah, and I want that choice to always be in your hands, and I'll never feel bad. I'll practice, actually, I'll practice, because I can't say I'll never feel bad. I'll practice not feeling bad if you choose someone else and choose someone else, then we come and see each other again. Because, hey, if you're choosing for yourself, that's fantastic. But there are some people that I have really long relations with. And many, though, are they come and then they go. And one of the last things I'll say is I try to tell people now, when you're in front of me and I'm talking to you, you're the most important person to me. But the moment you leave, my practice is to forget you. Because otherwise, I'm dragging you around with me everywhere. It's the same thing because otherwise, I drag my family into every interaction that we have. And having said that, they kind of do come because my son is like the biggest healer there is and he's only three, but still, that's the piece I'm trying to practice is letting go of the relationships, letting them be, and then pulling them up whenever they're there. Yeah. I think honoring flow, because people come and go into your life for a reason. It doesn't matter the durations, how present you are with them. That makes a difference. You can, it's just like, this moment we're creating with each other right now, we're all present and listening to each other, learning from each other, and maybe that's it. But it doesn't mean it's any less powerful than if we were to spend months and weeks together. I mean, of course, it does make a difference because then our different levels of vulnerability sheds off, but don't negate just because it's brief wasn't impactful, right? So there is just honoring the process that maybe this person's just meant to be with you for a short amount of time and that's okay. And I love that because I like to work holistically, meaning I am not your answer to everything, thank God. <laughs> and it means that you're seeing other people and that you're building your own tribe of support around you. That is good, right? And that is relationship building and building community. Yeah, I, I really appreciate the answers that have been shared so far. And I, I think in our work, we see a lot of people that have really thought a lot about wanting to experience 5-MEO. That's what they come to us for. They're looking for a safe container to have that experience. But this is very much a step on their journey. They, they've identified this as what they want to do. And we're here for this short time to, to help them create safety around that. And, and then they move on and they live their lives. And I think it's, it's kind of bittersweet because we, we get very, sometimes we get very attached to our clients in a way. They're, they're incredibly sweet people, but they're, they're, we sort of have to let them go and, you know, and live their lives. And that's, I think that's part of the, part of the beauty of this work is allowing people to come and, and to go and, and not to be, not to hold on to that, that relationship beyond where it serves. Yeah, I think there's a beauty of long-term relationship. I can speak from you know, a coach of mine or a therapist of mine. She can see me cycling through my patterns. 
that if I bob from facilitator to facilitator to facilitator, that can't be highlighted. So I you know I'm going on two years with her and she can she can see me. She knows my story, she knows my pattern, she can help me, you know, really change. So there's definite benefit to sticking to one practitioner long term, especially if you're seeing progress. Or even if you're looping, because that's the whole point. You're going to loop, and they're going to help you see your loop. So when I'm working with someone long term, I keep that in mind of, OK, I do have to start paying attention. <laughs> right? There is the people who come here and there, yeah, it's, hello, I'm present with you. I really like what you said. But once you leave, I might even forget your name, even though you had the most profound experience of your life with me, and I'm engraved in your subconscious mind forever. Right? There's a little bit of guilt. Next time I see them, like eight months later, I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> I know your face, but yeah, there's there's beauty of consistency in long term. Um, and then like what you said, you know, you might just be a stepping stone. And sometimes when s someone gets what they need from me, I really like to pass the baton because I can't, I'm not every, you know, I'm not the fix for everybody. They might need to do some somatic work and I'll send it over to this person or maybe they need to do work on their vocal coach. So like I'll have a, a singer in mind or maybe even I'll send them over to like I have a dear friend who works with Combo and I work with Combo and I say, you know what, I think she's actually a better fit for you. And beginner me thought, saw everybody as the competitor. I was like, I needed all the, the clients, me. I need to be the best in the world, all right? Why is that person's group filled and I only have eight people? Like, I need to get better. You know, there was that whole like competition in the early years. But now it's like, great, a client that was long-term with me now just bounced to this other Aya circle. I'm so happy that she found family over there. I mean, like, she's glowing. That's amazing that she found her community. And to really be able to, like, you know, pass somebody on to support each, like, each other as, as healers and as practitioner and really honoring and respecting the expertise and the medicine that each of you hold that, you know, I might not have embodied as well. So it's such an honor to be able to yeah, pass pass on a person. And even the word client, like you said, I don't like that word. There has to be a new human friend person, you know? I, I don't like to use that word. I've, I've yet to find a word. So if you have one that works, let me know. I just want to add a two cents to that too. Something I'm really passionate about is community and psychedelics. And I just want to share that like in the future, I really hope that there's more psychedelic community. And like in cities like Vancouver, we're really blessed. Other cities, they're starting to crop up all over the place. There's psychedelic societies in every city, and I really do think that moving forward, psychedelic communities can also really come in to support that and act as safety nets so that the practitioners have more freedom to choose whether they want a short or long-term relationship. Because I think in the past, it's been really hard to let your client just go because there's not many resources out there. But I really hope that moving forward, there's going to be so many more resources where you could literally point someone to a community and perhaps they'll find their own journey through there that will be really safe and supportive and we don't have to each practitioner themselves doesn't have to put the the weight of the burden of necessarily that whole journey to that client on themselves and they can pass that on to other uh, communities hi my name is dave there was a great question asked about the cultural safety and like the culture of the client and your own culture <coughs> And I was wondering how you, how you maneuver and navigate around the culture of the medicines that you're serving. Because a lot of the medicines don't have cultures, or were you know created in labs, or were oh, so, there we go. Sorry, and some of the medicines don't have cultures. You know, were created in labs like LSD or MDMA, or you know, grow everywhere in the world like psilocybin. Though even some of those strains of psilocybin have their own stories and their own cultures. A lot of these do come from indigenous peoples of the world across. And how do you, you know, maneuver around receiving as opposed to taking those traditions and presenting them yourselves if you're not of those cultures? Good question. There's a conversation of cultural appropriation. So that's one of the reasons why I don't pour ayahuasca or work with peyote. Those are medicines that have deep cultural roots and traditions. And if you want to work with that medicine to, to work with an elder of that tradition and get past the baton, definitely. And then, you know, I work with mushrooms, like you said, they, they're all over the world. There's so many ways to work with them. There's so many different cultures. And the way I started working with the medicine was I started to listen to them. And the mushrooms told me what to do. 
and I didn't go into another ceremony and I'm like, oh, I like how they open in their prayer. I'm going to take their prayer. And I like how they do that there, right? You know, that's what you, what cultural appropriation can be is like taking something, right, without the permission of understanding of what the the ritual or the, the meaning of that is. And I support the Blackfoot Sundance with my partner, Dais, and we go to Calgary. And there are songs that you do not sing outside of ceremony only for that specific ritual, for that round, for that moment in time, and you're not allowed to take it. So even the songs that we sing is to have permission. You know, we don't sing songs that we don't have permission for because even that can be some, a, a taking. So uh, yeah, a lot of the way that I serve has been through, through me, I, I made it up. And then I just happened to read it in a book and I'm like, whoa, this is somatic experiencing, you know, or like I go and learn, I take a course and I'm like, yeah, that's what was coming through. That's what the mushrooms were telling me to do and they explained it. So it, for me, I had this really, inc yeah, incredible journey of deeply listening and being a student to, to the mushrooms and they, they taught me most of everything I know and then my qualifications and my education just like affirmed it. Yeah, I, I very much resonate with that approach as well. I think that, you know, very much the way I approach facilitation is through my own experience with, with these medicines, primarily with 5-MeO. It's something that I don't really, you know, I, I take reference to how other people do it, but really it's, you know, it's how I've experienced it myself and how I've seen other people react and respond to the medicine and that's that's kind of the the data that I work with and the suggestions I'll make so I yeah I guess I see it as a very much sort of something that that grows organically through my own relationship with that very good question and culture appropriation is a big thing that I'm very conscious of. So when it comes to working with medicine that has a deep root and lineage, I will very gladly, happily pass the baton to them and give them a whole bunch of resources. And again, coming back to choice, let them choose what resonates for this individual who is seeking this form of modality of healing for themselves. For me, I like to work with medicine that doesn't have those kind of lineages because it feels more appropriate for me. And then when I work with medicine, I like aga, commune with the medicine and, and have the medicine teach me how it wants to be served through me because each person, each guide here works a little differently and the medicine knows that about us and will teach you how it wants to be served through you if you're open to that process. So I, I love to honor that and, and listen and tune in. So that's how I like to work and keeping in mind any and bringing in my own cultural pieces as well because I am Asian and Chinese and Japanese. I like to bring in those pieces as well to honor my lineage and this body that I have chosen this time around. The word that I just want to add is remix. One of my friends said that's like, we're all just remixing things, if we're being honest. Nothing's truly original, so to speak. Can we just own the remix? And each of us has our own individual remix. And the only other piece I'd add is my invitation is for us to less follow unspoken rules and actually listen to the explicit requests of people. Like, there's a lot of people say, this is the way it's supposed to be. It's like, no. If that person requested me not to sing that song, I love it. I was like, I'm going to respect that. But I'm not just going to assume that everything is supposed to be a certain way because I've got different assumptions than everyone else does. So how do we just keep playing and actually being more able to communicate what the boundaries are? Yeah. So thanks for the question. Hi, my name is Daron. Simple question. How do you get clients? Is it referral based? Is it how, how does it how does a guy? Okay. Yeah. I you know it, it's a mix, right? I, there's referrals are a big part. You know. Working with 5-MeO in particular, we're very lucky it's not a scheduled substance in Canada. 
So you know, we have a website that's on Google. If you type in 5MEO DMT Vancouver, we're like first or second result. So we get a lot of people that way. And referrals, you know, referrals from other people. And I think, you know, the beautiful thing about the diversity of different people doing this work is that there's somebody for everyone. And not everyone is the right fit for every journeyer, right? So we, we're, we're generally very generous sending referrals. And we've been very blessed to receive a lot of referrals from other people in our community. Putting it out there into the universe. <laughs> <laughs> put that out there too <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously it's just like even my work with medicine I was like oh I am curious about this I want to learn more in the universe it's like what you seek in the universe the universe will seek you back sometimes more than what you expected so be very careful in what you ask and and so usually it's just putting it out there and educating people, uh, especially when there's so much stigma or cultural perceptions around this kind of work. It's just educating and empowering others that whatever will make the right decision for them, they'll find you. And the right people will find you if you're more open to that process. But if you get into that space of like, ah, I need this client and I'm going to try to get this client from here and steal this client from there and get into, you're going to attract those type of clients that you don't want to work with. So it's just really honoring where you're at and then putting it out there and educating and being open and those clients will come. I mean, of course, you also have to put in work and effort. It doesn't just let me, poop, but it's both. It's not just one without the other. I love that Aga did that first because it's totally true, right? <laughs> Whatever you're putting out there, easy, lucrative, and fun is now how I put it because I'm like, oh, why would I want the hard, difficult clients for me? It doesn't mean they're hard and difficult for everyone. But the pieces I'd bring in is who, not how. I'm really good at some things, and I'm terrible at others. So I'm partnering with other people who want to play a part because there's so many people who have so many skills that will be better than me. Building the website, being the concierge now, all these pieces, they're flowing into place. And then being clear who you want to be. My bigger aspiration, I've said this on my profile, is I want to have a 1,000 people in a breath work. Not because I want a 1,000 clients, but because I want to be one of the people that brings people in experientially and then guides them to other people. Because that way, there's more flow. And that is one of the biggest problems in this work, especially when you're starting, is the flow. How do I flow things in properly? And I want that flow to be there, and I want people to realize it's the who, not how. It's not how do I become better at every aspect of it. It's who do I invite in? Who do I partner with? And that's part of the flying sage. It's who. You're bringing lots of who's together in a way where the collective wisdom is so much smarter than any one of us on our own. I need to add one more thing. Oh no, I feel it leaving my brain. It's the willingness to be seen. Because oftentimes when we're doing this work, I hear people starting, no matter what kind of work, it doesn't have to be this work. It's like, how come I don't get clients? How come so-and-so gets clients? And, and then you see them and they don't talk about what they do. They're sometimes ashamed or worried about what people think about what they do. And I'm like, well, if you're not willing to be seen, why would clients come and see you? <laughs> no one's seeing you because you don't even want to see yourself. So, yeah. Hi, thank you. Thank you for the presentation and the talk. Uh, love your energy, you guys, you know, all together. It's amazing. So, how do underground facilitators can protect themselves legally from unhappy clients? Unhappy clients. First of all, a waiver was really helpful. A lawyer. There are specific lawyers, criminal lawyers, and lawyers that work with psychedelics, so we, we definitely have one of those, and a waiver. And then, you know, just, again, prayers. Um, it's a really tricky territory because, yeah, you're working with illegal substances, but Vancouver is very lenient to that. I mean, you know, you even posted on Instagram, Hey, I'm a psychedelic facilitator. I'm doing illegal things. Find me here. <laughs> and it's so and so, yeah. And it's it's a it's a tricky place to be. And I've I've spoken to a few people who are well versed in this. And I asked like, what, you know, how loud can I be? Can I will I get in trouble? And the feedback I got from some politicians and I think is Dave White, Dana Dana Larson. I asked Dana Larson this question because he opened the cannabis 
the first cannabis store and then the mushroom dispensary and, you know, mushrooms. I thought, what is going on, right? And he says, a judge probably won't fine you for trying to help somebody with their depression, especially if you're working with something like mushrooms. It's because it's so, it's in the, the field right now that it's for healing that they're, they might, he said, they'll just you know, give you a slap on the wrist, but in the end, you, you won't really get fined with anything. But yeah, the forms and also documenting every single thing emails back and forth after you have a phone call with them, wrote, write down what was spoken about, especially if things start going sideways. If, you know, undiagnosed bipolar sometimes doesn't show up until after your ceremony and then you're like, oh man, now I'm in, I should, I didn't even see those red flags or the person didn't have red flags and now all the red flags are showing up after. So, you know, this is speaking from personal experience to have all of that on hand because when the lawyer comes or, you know, they're hunting for evidence, you can have your back. You can say, nope, this is this call that was discussed, this was this, and then also have your own lawyer so that they can read over all your emails before you send it over and incriminate yourself. So waivers, lawyer, document everything. And also, to avoid it, don't practice out of scope. If you're beginning, don't work with PTSD, don't work with bipolar, don't work with depression, don't work with manic, whatever. Just, you know, really in... And this is hard too because sometimes that stuff just comes out, but really intake form, huge interview process and lots of prep work so that you can avoid those situations. Just to reiterate, up until the very moment you take the medicine, no can be present. And each of us has our own things that we put in there. I've had a ceremony where I ignored every single no that came up. And obviously it went sideways. It turned out fine, but it went sideways. And so know that that's what's there for. That's why you set little procedures for yourself. Whatever you want to set, set them and then make those your safeguards. Because that's more important than how do you get out of it. And all the stuff Agatha said, super important. But let's not get there if we don't have to. And just remember, you can always say no. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. I'm just curious. Actually, all the questions I had were just answered, so it was awesome. I had one last question that I thought about. In situations where people go really deep and they start having ego dissolution stuff come up, right? Obviously, a lot of things can take care of themselves because the inner intelligence comes up. But when if they go sideways or if there's difficult transitions there, I'm just curious on any lessons you've learned in those specific situations, like either things you've done to help clients through or things that have come through you that you found were helpful? And how do you support people after that if they have difficulty integrating that? Or do you? I guess that's my question. So anything around this ego death stuff? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Take this. Well, I guess one thing that comes up quite frequently is, is a feeling of overwhelm after the session, that there's so much material that, that functionality is perhaps diminished in, in, in the ways that they're used to. And, you know, we talk to clients about this beforehand. We, we talk about leaving space for integration, that this is maybe a big opening. You need to be gentle with yourself. You need to create room. But still, it can be a lot. And I think, you know, what we find is, is really just being there and being reassuring that this is a process that takes time to unfold. What you're experiencing now, yes, honor it, be with it, but it won't be this way forever. In a sense, this is a wonderful opening now, this, this ability to be with all of these difficult emotions. In two weeks, you may not have the same access. This rawness may not be there. So cherish this time that, that you have and, and be patient with this process. And that's been, I think, the biggest advice that we've given in, in, in these difficulties. And, and, and this is quite a common difficulty that people do have afterward. This is a really deep question, so I'll only speak to the things that are coming to the surface right now. One of them is the client who's attacking you or seeing you as the devil, the demon, something else like that. And just one of the practices I was taught, just reminded, is like, I'm nobody. 
I'm nobody. There's nothing to attack. And it also reflects me. One of my gene keys is invisibility. That's my highest city. And it's just a reminder. Can we actually be invisible? Like we, we are not the focus of it, but we'll allow ourselves to be the focus for you so you can get that out. Another piece is to not do this alone, obviously. Do it with someone else. But even then, when something goes sideways for you, we've had this at one of our fit-for-service things. Someone had served Pape. They had a, t a really challenging experience, and then they called me over to help support. And I love that because let's keep asking for those that you know in the roles that they can. When Aga said, practice in your scope, if you're out of your scope, ask for the help from the people that you can see that would be in their scope, right? You're not supposed to be able to hold it all. And the best thing that we can do, and that's from the boy, the mole, the fox, and whatever it is, is what's the bravest thing you've ever said? Help, right? Even as facilitators, we need help. We want help. We request help. And can we request it when we want it as well? And then the third thing is keep it simple. Like in those moments, simple, soft, like as if they're that child, you're safe. I've had someone talk to me for four hours, tell me they need to call an ambulance. I'm like, you're safe. You're safe. Following your heartbeat, you're safe. It's all good. Yeah. And that's all they need to hear over and over again until they came out. Right? And I'm sure there's more, but I'm going to let these guys jump in first. So the question was what happens when there's ego disillusion and they're just kind of like freaking out? It's either freaking out or just any way that you show up or you found patterns in how you show up or... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, um, anything around it. So when they're they're so far gone that their eyes kind of glaze over and they're not there anymore and they can't receive instruction, they're almost like a robot. Just there's a script and you can you can see that something is looping in their subconscious and an implicit memory or thought or feeling is becoming explicit. What well, my approach is act it out and actually play the part. I'm obviously a symbol. And if I play the role appropriately, they can discharge that thing that's been trapped in their nervous system looping forever. So those are really challenging journeys that take all your presence and all your attention, and it's exhausting, and all it is is just loving compassion. Like you said, you're safe, or you know, encouraging them, them to scream if it's anger. It's not trying not to suppress anything, and remembering that everything's okay. Even though inside you're like, oh shit, I broke this person. <laughs> oh my god, are they gonna, are they gonna make, the, make it through? It's like, everything's okay, nothing's wrong. Yeah, I mean, it looks pretty crazy, but nothing's wrong. And you know, they'll put the pieces back together tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> and funny enough, like some of those experiences I've seen in those ceremonies of like, yeah, up a little bit of, in my earlier days before I learned that everything's okay. Those people made the biggest transitions, the hugest transitions with their pro the appropriate integration. And half the time, they didn't even remember what happened. They actually blanked out. So in those cases, yeah, just remembering you're acting something out with them and compassion and just making sure that they're safe. And then in regards to integrating an experience like that is being aware of what was moving through and then being able to support that content um, yeah, I, I can speak to my own emotion, my own process recently. After 13 years of working with psychedelics, I finally accessed my repressed emotion, my repressed memory of when I was four or five. It took 13 years of psychedelics, five years of somatic experiencing, five years of breath work of chipping away at this thing. And finally, when I was resourced enough to feel that unbearable feeling that my body finally trusted me with the information of this terrible, horrible, nasty thing, I was able to process it. And it was exactly that. Just all of this stuff coming out from all over the place. I was that person, you know? And then the integration period is hard. My nervous system was frazzled. I was ungrounded, I was emotional, I was depressed, I was exhausted, I felt broken. And during that time is slow down, ground, get into your body, have your practitioners, so I, you know, I see my therapist, my somatic experiencing practitioner, you know, practices that get me in the body and just understanding that, yeah, I'm in defrag mode. I just defrag my system. <laughs> and it's gonna take a while for the computer to like boot up again and to have the compassion to, for self, but also the patience to know that the pieces will come together again. 
I like that word patience and slowing down because oftentimes after those big ego disillusion, we're like, oh, now we know. I fully understand everything now. And then I have to do it all at once. <laughs> and I'm going to see this practitioner, this practitioner, this practitioner. This I'm like, oh, that's a lot. So it's just to slow down. I, and I mean, to take your question a step further, oftentimes anyone I work with from a personal you know, practice, I like to build those in because I don't know when that's going to happen for this client or not. So I'm going to build those like, let's build you tools. Let's build you self-regulation. Let's practice getting you in your body, getting grounded before even we do any of this. What is your support tribe like? What, who do you go see besides me? Like understanding all that and then resourcing them with all the other things before we go there. Because so then when they do go there and they're having a hard time integrating, they have things to fall back on and slowly and then understand that, that and normalizing it that it is normal because oftentimes when we feel something that's strange or uncomfortable, we feel like, oh man, I think I broke myself and I'm the only one <laughs> that's going through this, which is not true. And so normalizing it and reassuring them. And then, you know, if you are skilled, again, practicing with your own scope, using that information on how to allow that process that was not incomplete and that's why it's showing up and looping to actually act out and complete in that process so that it can actually be acted out. So, but not everyone can be able to do that because it does take a lot of energy and a lot of skill. So if you don't have that skill set, don't do it because it can cause more harm, yeah. And just understanding and practicing and through practice and through understanding where your own comfort level is, going with it too also helps. Like when a client screams, I scream with them full heartedly. And then even dropping into that space and giving them that permission. And then when they see you doing it, they're like, oh, I can actually do this now. And it's okay because they've been suppressing it for so long. So there's so many, all said and done, there's so many different ways of doing it. There's no right or wrong. It's just learning to discern and knowing how to synthesize what's right for this client in this moment. Yeah. I just want to highlight what Aga said. Like, if it's coming up, you have all the skills there, so can you be present with it? The screaming part. I love it when uh, someone screams like, okay, now twice as loud. Now as loud as you dare. Like, elevate that if that's what's called for. And then when something happens, I'm reminding myself the facilitator side, like Sagan has this beautiful facilitator circle. Like Michael has this great list of practitioners. So reaching out, like when stuff has happened, I've reached out, not just to my co-facility here, but to the ones that I look up to as well, because that's what we're here for. We're here to keep getting mentored and learn. Like, we did it great. Now what else was there to learn from that, and how can we do that better in the future? Because I want to be able to hold that. And then the third thing is, do I really want to keep creating scenarios like that? Because I used to say, oh, I can hold anything. It's like, no, I don't want to hold anything. I want to be very clear this is the kind of ceremony I feel called to hold. And if something comes up, OK, but I'm not inviting in those crazy experiences. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Appreciate it. One quick thing I wanted to add is mentorship. As a guide, have somebody who is better than you, has been doing it longer, and be transparent when you mess up. I mean, I've had so many terrible ceremonies and oopsie, <laughs> and all like stuff that just made me like cripple in shame of like, yeah, I did that thing. I did that thing and it, it broke me, but being able to go to my mentors and, and speak to them of like, how could I handle it? And is this normal? Is this okay? To really give ourselves permission to mis make mistakes. Because yeah, there's gonna be mistakes, but yet, like you mentioned before, they're also learning opportunities. They showed up because it's gonna serve you and your, not client, person, and your loved one in some way, but being able to be humble and vulnerable in that sense. Thank you. Just being mindful of time, we're gonna wrap up questions there. If you still have some more questions, some of the facilitators, panelists might be walking around after. There's a few things I wanted to share though. So first of all, you might have noticed when you came in, there's some beautiful jewelry and also some candles at the back there. And so after this, I encourage you to go check those out if you haven't already. Nicholas brought some of the beautiful jewelry and then Sagan and Helena brought their candles here. And we also have a, a prize that I wanted to give out we I randomly selected two people that bought tickets and so Lele and Kate Morris which is funny because you're both sitting right next to each other you guys can come find me after and then I have a gift for you 
And the last thing I wanted to do was just invite each of you to share with the audience where people can find you. Mm, okay. Thesomaheart.com is my partner and I. We're about to go to Portugal, so we don't got much on the calendar. <laughs> but we do facilitate. If you go to our website on our events page, everything's in code. Most things are in code. Sound journey is an enhanced sound journey with mushrooms and Syrian root. We work with that combination in our sound journey. And that's like a mid dose. It's like something that you don't have to prep too much because you're not going to have your ego disillusion. You will probably won't have to go see your therapist later. It's your tune up to feel your feelings and be bathed in sound. And then what do we got coming up? And I do, I'm really passionate about song and voice. So I do monthly song circles where you know, I have about a dozen drums, hand held drums, not djembes. So I, I teach a lot of the, the songs that we sing in ceremony. So there's a monthly, along with sound baths without mushrooms. And then I think December, yeah, December 9th is our next sound journey. And in the new year, look out for retreats. Yeah, I work a lot with combo as well. Combo's not a, a psychedelic, but that's something that's coming up in November. Oh, and then microdosing. I offer microdosing coaching. I'm sure about my microdoses here. I pack microdoses with love and good intention. And on mid-November, I'll be starting a nine-week journey through the chakras. So it's a group program where we're microdosing and then exploring our energy centers through weekly practices for self, self-awareness self and expanding self-expression. I'm all about expression because of all the suppression I experienced in my life. Really seeing that authenticity and expression is, is such a powerful path to, to, heal, to healing. So... That's my nutshell. And you can find us at earthlings.institute. We've got all of our information about our offerings there. We do private sessions. We have a retreat coming up, a 5MEO retreat, December 8th to 10th. We have some flyers for that on Helena's table in the back there. We also run integration circles. I think our next one's on this Saturday. We go do those monthly. We also have facilitator circles. Off the top of my head, I don't remember when our next one is, but it's on our website. Or maybe o- o- October 16th. Thank you. Yeah. Or just come talk to us. We'll be in the back and we can talk more about what we do. You can find me on Instagram or website. So it's Rain or Shine Therapy. I specialize a lot in preparation and integration work with psychedelics and also facilitating it. Of course, I don't really see it on the website, just for legalities. But talking about events, I do run sound baths, breath work. Upcoming up, I collaborate a lot. So a lot of the events that I run in collaboration with my partner, Lucin, the company's Lucinor.net. You can find us on, on our website. And also on Instagram would be Lucinor underscore. And our rule... We have an upcoming ceremony of NN DMT on October 13th. If that's interesting, if that interests you. And then we also specialize in microdosing DMT, either 5 MU or NN DMT, and how you can use that in conjunction with other modalities and how that really allows your body to drop in those spaces and those tools in ways that you didn't even know you could do. Yeah. Wow, there's so many offerings. This is so cool. So my who's are helping me right now with my website, ohanabreath.com. The easiest way to get hold of me is one of the orange cards on the back table. Just give me a text. The biggest offering is online breath right now. I make it accessible to all because I want that to be something that draws you into experiential processes. And you can refer it to anyone you want to bring in so they can experience something and then know what next. And that's the biggest goal I have for that. I want that to grow to be so big that people are just coming into consciousness and finding whoever they want to find. Courtney and I do in-person in Vancouver breath groups. Best to get a hold of her for that because she is great at helping to organize that. So please chat with her for that. In terms of more private stuff, so we do many modalities. I've realized now it's so much more fun to stack medicines that are a specific protocol for what you're looking for. And speaking of the money side of things, on our side, it's in the thousands of dollars. So we have very specific things for private journeys. And I make them high value because I want that to be what that experience is. But I also want us to be fully accessible. That's why we have the group breaths. That's why we have the group online breaths as well. And that's why there's so many practitioners. Let's work together and not just see that there's one way to do things. And how do we keep elevating together? 
And then really, if anyone forgets all of this, just reach out to Michael, because he's got all of us, and he is the connector of everyone. And I'm just going to put that on his hat as well. <laughs> and that one last thing I'll just say is that I love what you're doing in community, and I had the idea recently that the number of people multiplied by the length of the container is almost like the length of the marriage that you have. So you've got like over 100 people, I think, in the flying stage now, and you've gone for, I don't even know, like a year, let's say. That's like over 100 years of marriage you've helped people work through. Mm -hmm. So please keep doing that and know that all the stuff that comes up, all the shit that comes up, it's supposed to. And know that all of us here for sure are here with your best interests in mind and always holding you in the highest regards. So thank you so much, Michael. Thank you so much for those kind words. I really appreciate it. And thank you all for coming tonight. I'll just mention a few other things as well. With my own facilitator hat, I want to mention, cause, just because it's distinct from the offerings that have been shared, that me and my partner and a co-facilitator, Moran, are offering an MDMA retreat on Bowen at Sagan Helena Space on October, the last weekend of October. And then putting my Flying Sage hat on, I wanted to Thank you all for being here and also share a little bit about the upcoming offerings we have with the Flying Sage. Because I mentioned at the beginning, we have three to four events per week now, which I'm really excited about. This is a big transition for us. And honestly, it's like feeling like this right now. Um, so all of your support is greatly appreciated as we kind of try to scale up to be able to offer more stuff like this. And so this is one of our monthly offerings now. We're going to be doing this once a month, returning to that cadence. On October 30th is our next one. The topic is going to be psychedelics and elite performance. And so far, we have an Olympic javelinist, a uh, movement flow instructor, and we also have, it's slipping my mind at the moment, but we have a third panelist lined up, but I'm going to have four in total. So that'll be on October 30th here in a similar fashion to this, which will be really exciting. And then as well, we've got two other monthly offerings that we've just started. So we have an ecstatic dance. We just did our first one over the weekend, which is really great. It's called Lumio. And that is going to be on October 20th. And then we also have something called Ascension, which I know quite a few of you came to, where we walk, do a walking meditation through a labyrinth, and then we do a sound bath. And all of these events, except for this one probably, are medicine friendly. You can come to med with medicine to this, but I might not be the best idea. But the other, the other ones are really supposed to be a safe space for you to explore medicines. We really emphasize harm reduction with those sort of events. And then a few other things to mention, we're launching our cold plunge challenge, which I'm really excited about. Gabo is going to be facilitating breath work for us. We've got Qigong facilitated by Keem after that. And that's going to be an 11 week long challenge for anyone that wants to incorporate cold exposure, breath work, and Qigong for mental health, mental clarity, optimability, all of those things. And there'll be a bunch of prizes as well for that. And then in addition to that, we have integration circles every Tuesday. We also have cannabis ceremonies every other Wednesday. And we have four ACO DMT microdose breath work every Thursday with Gabo and Khan. If you haven't gone to one of those yet, definitely encourage you to check it out. Really beautiful offering. So those are a few of the things that I want to mention and all that's tied together in this platform that we have. And as Nick alluded to, we have about 150 members now, which I'm really grateful for. We started our membership about a year ago. And so it's slowly been growing. A lot of people here have come to this event for free because they're members. And if you would like to choose to support the Flying Sage, that's one of the best ways to do so. So I, that's uh, one ask that I'm putting out there as well. So yeah, if you have any questions about Flying Sage, come see me. If you have any questions for these wonderful, amazing facilitators, please please go grab them before they um, disappear into the magical ether. And yeah, let's give them all a round of applause again. Thank you so much, everyone.